Feeding our babies is supposed to come naturally. We see images of cooing babies and smiling moms and doting grandmas and expect that to be us. We don't see all the struggle that goes into every decision that seems so high stakes at the time. We don't expect all the leaking, the engorgement, the deciding to take a break. We don't expect all the judgment, whether we breastfeed or bottle feed or pump or don't. Or maybe we do expect all those things and it comes smooth sailing. But what I have encountered as a doula, a childbirth educator, and a lactation professional is that when I tell people what I do, the stories flow out naturally. And I love hearing them. I hope you do too. I'm your host, Lo. Welcome to the Milk Making Minutes. Hi, Amy. Welcome to the Milk Making Minutes. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Amy. So, I'm so happy that you're on the podcast. I'm laughing because it feels kind of funny to talk to you more officially because you are my older sister. Not wiser, but older. <laughs> no, wiser in many ways. And um, we were just, before I hit recording, we were just talking about how um, Danielle, who is on episode one of the podcast, she is, well, we call her our cousin, but she's really our cousin's yeah. wife. And she was the one who told me I should ask you to be on the podcast because in our minds, um, you were somebody who paved the way for us when it comes to breastfeeding. And so I'm really happy to be having this conversation with you. Well, uh, for y'all, it makes me tear up. And I just, I don't, I didn't see it that way, but if that's the way you guys feel it, it, it's very honoring. I think the Lord was gracious to me. Uh, in that journey and I just felt compelled to encourage people that wanted to that you can do it I had a little bit of a rough start but we made it through it's very funny now when I look back it wasn't funny at the time because I'm very it tired. never is it never <laughs> is frustrated but it's funny now I can laugh about it now yeah so do you want to um just give a brief synopsis of your family introduce your family however you feel most fitting on a public podcast yes. um yeah so um, I actually have six children. Mm -hmm. um, three of my children I did not get to birth, um, and I have a I did adopt them, um, and they are older. And I have three younger biological children. Um, I have Michaela who is thirteen, will be fourteen in May. I have a ten-year-old uh, boy, uh, mm -hmm. Jacob, that will uh, he was born on leap day because he like to make his arrival late and grand and i have a four-year-old who is crazy yes. who is also happens to be born on the same day as your child <laughs> yes on the exact same day yeah. <laughs> and yeah and the funny story about that is i was having a planned home birth <laughs> with her that i did not tell the family because i was feeling self-conscious about it and you had an accidental home birth this with her Oh, yeah, on the exact same day. So that's funny. In different states. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and Michaela, who is almost 14. Yes. Um, you welcomed her into yes. the world and then adopted your older yes. kids. We took custody of them when she was four weeks old. Wow. And I look back on that now and I, it was total insanity. <laughs> yeah. But I do feel like the Lord equipped and put people around, very supportive people. And, um, I don't know how I did it, but for the grace of God, actually. But um, yeah, it was a whirlwind for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, and you were learning to navigate breastfeeding at that very same yes. time. So and I had a anyone... very frustrating experience with Michaela and yeah. I all that cooperative. Yeah. So uh, let's back up a little bit because I okay. definitely want to get into all of that. Um, I'm so interested to know because we've never really talked about this. What was your exposure to breastfeeding? before you had Michaela? I didn't have a lot, actually. We were talking at one point, me and you, I guess, and earlier, and, and I don't think I had a lot of exposure. No one, it wasn't like talked about in our family, per se. We have a pretty large family. 
I just don't know if it was just a topic people didn't like to talk about or that they just, there was an opportunity to talk about it. But I think because I am a nurse, I was probably exposed a lot to, you know, lots of medical learning in school and then working at the hospital. Um, and I had, I guess, had already decided, you know, that I would attempt breastfeeding because of the benefits of it. Were you but I didn't know mostly, a lot, actually. Were you thinking mostly medical benefits? Well, probably both medical and, you know, emotional bonding. You just hear so much now about the importance um, of mm -hmm. breastfeeding. If you can, I hold no judgment towards people that either don't want to or can't. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like if you can and you're willing to try, then I think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And Plus, had you had any knowing I was getting those children <laughs> along mm -hmm. the way when I was pregnant, I looked at the cost of formula and thought, oh my gosh, I need breastfeed. <laughs> <laughs> so did you actually price it out? I didn't price it fully out, but when I, I had some people in my church group and whatnot that had couldn't breastfeed or chose not to, and they were talking about the cost of formula, and I was like, how much is that? And I, I think wandering through the baby aisles, I had a little bit of sticker shock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, did you have friends that had breastfed before you? Um, there was a couple of families. Yes, there was a couple of families that had had a baby just prior to me that had uh, breastfed. And I think it was becoming just more normalized um, that you breastfed. And I don't know. I think some women feel more judged, I would say, because they choose not to. But mm -hmm. you have to do what's best for your family and mm -hmm. you know trying to if especially if you're a full-time working mother sometimes it's not always feasible to be able to do that right yeah and um did you ever have any conversations with mom about her experiences breastfeeding i Please. didn't but now that you have mentioned it i think i may ask her yeah okay so you just knew you were gonna try yes and you were thinking about all the different factors cost of formula Yes, um, and just convenient. And to be honest, I, I'm, an, I have always loved competing in sports, and I was going to be danged if I couldn't do it. <laughs> once, <laughs> once I was uh, in the in the thick of it, wanting to throw my hands in the air in utter frustration, I, it became uh -huh. more of a competition of uh, this. Me and this baby are going to just we're going to figure it out. Okay. And so would you say the hardest experience was with Michaela? Yes, for sure. 100%. Okay. Okay. I would love to know, we know that birth outcomes have an impact on, um, feeding on, yes. on how, how feeding goes. And so okay. even though this isn't a birth centered f podcast, can you give just a brief synopsis on what your birth experiences were like? Um, um, I had very easy pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really have a lot of, you know, uh, morning sickness or complications, none of that. Um, I worked out through my entire pregnancy um, and she was late actually, almost a week late. Um, mm -hmm. And when I went into labor, um, I was trying actually to go into work at that time. I was working in a cancer center <laughs> and my boss mm. said, do not show up here. Cause I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> because you thought you might have been in labor. And I was like, what's the matter? There's lots of nurses and doctors there. And they're like, uh, no, we don't deliver babies. So stay. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, I did labor throughout the day. My total in labor was about 31 hours. It was very long, but, um, most of that done at home. Uh huh. And uh, my OB, Joanne, who I loved, told me, don't come in until you're five minutes apart. And um, I allowed, uh, you know, my husband uh, to go play soccer. <laughs> and when he got back, I was like, that was a mistake. We got to go right now. <laughs> um, and I was pretty sick by the time I got to the hospital, pretty in pretty miserable state. And I had chosen that I wanted an epidural and all of that mm -hmm. prior, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which I was actually grateful for. But it turned out I get there and it took longer than I wanted to get checked in. And um, I was pretty sick um, just from the labor pains, but found out mm -hmm. the reason I was having such a hard time was because she was sunny side up. Ah. 
<clears throat> and um, they could not get her turned over. So I spent several hours um, having to flip side to side. And my doctor would come in every now and again and try and, like, get her flipped over. And this and was after I, you were already on the epidural? or Yeah, it was after I was okay. already on the epidural. Okay. Um, and then, um, she, fi- he did finally come in and say, if I can't get her to flip over, I'm just going to have to take her by C-section, which I had Ooh. wanted to birth her naturally, but, um, I was okay with that because I just knew that whatever was, you know, best for everyone's, you know, well-being and yeah. the baby that, that needed to happen. I think it's important to not hold tight to your birthing plan if you have one just because to allow yourself flexibility yeah and you know your birthing story is still your birthing story and if it didn't happen exactly the way that you wanted but yeah um give yourself some grace for that but um yeah so I said okay that's fine and then um she did end up flipping over and then he told me oh you're in really good shape I don't imagine this ruined me with him saying that you should only have to push for one hour oh, or so. No. And it was the uh, two solid hours of pushing oh, and oh, contractions on top of each other that I was having to break. And then they had to put oxygen on me because they were, it was just, <laughs> the, that was a little, you know, tiring, exhausting. I finally pulled off the oxygen mask and said, I can't push anymore, but I had no, no choice because she was partially out. Yeah. But, um, she did come and it was fine. And, uh, and then, um, I did feel very, uh, supported, uh, you know, they had lots of lactation consultants come in, but I just couldn't, she just, um, she just couldn't, uh, she had just had trouble, uh, latching. So what, so she, so she's born and then you got that immediate, did they, did you get immediate skin to skin time? Was uh, yes, you, yes, I okay. did. Okay, so you get immediate skin to skin time, and then how long before she tried to latch? Was it I right think away? It was pretty right away. Yeah, they encouraged like almost right away. Okay, and was it right away that you knew that oh this does not feel right, or did it take a while? It took a while because I wasn't sure what was normal. Okay, um, but they could tell like the lactation consultant. If I, it, it's been 13 years, so I'm trying to remember if she came in right away or if the nurse was trying to help me. Mm-hmm. And I think she was, like, sucking, but I don't think she was um, attached, like, the way she was supposed to, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, was, uh, what I found out later, which I wish somebody had kind of... Well, no, a lactation consultant did tell me that. And I feel like, in you know, in God's design, it was so beautiful is that you're panicking because you're thinking I can't feed my baby. They're so going to be so hungry, but like they have enough stores from you after birth to last about two day, two or three days, which is about the time it takes for your milk to actually come in. Right. And their, their, their stomachs are like the size of a cherry. <laughs> right. And they were like, that's what, what was also uh, told to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so she was, when you say she wasn't latching, do you mean she wasn't, like it was a really loose latch or it felt just, wrong? Yeah, or... both. She was having trouble attaching. Okay. And then um, the, they were coming in and, you know, messing with her and um, they, they tried all kinds of things. The shield, putting a little formula. Mm-hmm. Um, And she, it's like, she just couldn't take, Yeah, uh, she just couldn't figure it out, I guess. And, uh, then she started doing this weird thing where she was choking basically. Um, and we were having to suction. That was probably the scariest. She actually did it one time at home and we got pretty close to calling 911 because I couldn't get it out. I, you know, even with the bulb suction. Yeah. So, um, it was probably two solid weeks of just utter frustration uh she was probably frustrated i was probably frustrated they had sent home some formula to supplement and then um they were real they had a free like lactation consultant you could go to but i think about the time i was about to give up is she she got it i mean it was lots of bleeding and (laughs) other things on my part you know just pay you know the 
stuff you hear like as you're that nobody told me about that would happen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so you were in pain. She wasn't really suctioning properly. Yeah. Were you going back to the hospital for those visits? For the, I didn't go back to the hospital. I did call her in multiple times, uh, like to the room, and, and they came every time. Okay. So while uh, you were at the hospital, before you got home, they would always yes. come. Yes. And did anyone ever do an oral evaluation of her mouth to see if there was anything going on anatomically? Maybe the lactation consultant looked, but I don't remember... Because I remember Charlie had some stuff, right? When he was, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I don't think they did. They, they probably looked in her mouth, but I don't think no. For my remembrance, I don't think they did a full evaluation on to see if yeah. it was her. And were they concerned about weight gain? Um, that had always my babies were always very tiny. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was a normal size born, but like as they grew, they were always like real little. But yeah, yeah. that was a concern. At, but not a concern uh, in the first couple of weeks, no. Okay, okay. All right. So um, so you felt supported. Yes. But you were still worried. Because yes. Because it just didn't feel right. Right, yeah. I could just and tell she was not me. latching. You know, you try a yeah. hundred times. You know, your mm -hmm. nipples are bleeding. You're, they hurt mm -hmm. so bad. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and you were offering the formula in addition to feeding it the yeah, breast. So, so yeah, I, we would have these little tiny uh, syringes, mm. and then we would use the syringe um, um, to feed her, basically, and try and get her to like open her mouth. We were just trying all these little tricks that they had given mm. given us. It's so funny. You think you know your sister's story so well. And I don't remember, like, I remember it being difficult. But, yeah, you know, when you think back after, I hadn't had a child at that point. So yeah. now looking at your experience now through the lens of having had my own experience, I'm like, oh, my gosh, how awful I didn't. I just didn't know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You just don't know how hard it is until you've been through it. Hmm. So how long, um, so you're, you're in the hospital for the typical three days or something? Yes, two, three yeah, days. I think we went home on the third day, possibly, I think. In there okay. two days and then went home on the third day. Okay, and so you go home. Yeah. And it's still not feeling right. Right. And, and I'm trying to pump. <laughs> that was probably my biggest mistake. Oh, so you were so concerned about supply. Yes, I was very concerned about supply. That you just started pumping right away. So I don't know if somebody told me this or if I got this idea in my head. I, I can't. I can't actually remember. But somebody had said if you will pump between feedings, um, even if it's for just five minutes, then um, you'll end up with a pretty big supply when you go back to work, and it won't be quite as. You won't always be trying to play catch up. Or if you go to the grocery store, you know, and you're getting a text. It's, child is screaming and nothing's going to fix it but you mm -hmm. they there would be supply there and so i think i put too much looking back i put too much pressure on myself to start the pumping like i really started the pumping right away mm -hmm. yeah so <laughs> you had this pressure what when were you planning to go back to work i was going to take the full 12 weeks off Okay, so you were going to take the quote-unquote full 12 weeks, yeah. which, you know, yes. a 12-week baby is so tiny. Yes. Um, but that's what we get. Um, you were going to take the full 12 weeks off, but in your mind, you needed to start pumping on day <laughs> Like day two. two. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, consequently, our dad, who loves to be helpful... Uh, ran out the minute that the nurse suggested a pump and came back like two hours later with a breast pump. I have no oh, idea what this goodness. man said to these people at Bye Bye Baby or where Babies Are Us. I think you got it. Uh, the, the very one that she suggested. Oh my goodness. Yes. It was, it was quite humorous. Yeah. So it must have been that the Medela 
Like, yeah, I still have it, actually, and several yeah. people have um, used it. I mean, they bought their own. Um, yeah. And I'm still pondering yeah. what I should do with it. Like, it just seems so sad to get rid of it. I don't know. My breastfeeding days are over, but. <laughs> yeah. You can. They, there's a recycling program. You can yeah. recycle it. <laughs> I mean, those pumps have a one-year warranty. <laughs> yes. You know what's funny is it still works. Like it. That's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, so on top of being worried about your own nipples and being worried about your baby not feeding, um, you're worried about your future milk supply and you've already started pumping was she a baby that would just nurse all day every day Um, or was she a sleepy baby my unfortunately none of my children wanted to ever sleep Uh and so she was up all the time Mm -hmm. um and not she was my my kids uh michaela and riley both spit up all the time all the time Mm -hmm. so i had to walk around with like a burp rag so when Jacob didn't, it was so shocking to me. That's because that's all I had known was just changing outfits mm-hmm. and my shirt having constant spit up on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, they didn't, they weren't ever great sleepers. Yeah. And some of that was just having three other kids and um, the mentality of like, well, we just got to adjust and figure it out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, how... Did you ever seek a um, private practice lactation consultant or anyone to try to help you figure out how to improve the latch? Or did you just wait for it to get better? I kind of just waited for it to get better. Mm. I think I may have called because you can call the uh, up to the lactation consultants at Baylor, the hospital that I had delivered at. Mm -hmm. But really, it was just more... I'm going to keep trying this until it kills me, basically. <laughs> yeah. And finally, after about two weeks, it was like, she just got it. It was, I, about the time I was going to give up. Mm-hmm. I, just, like, I guess, I guess she just can't. I don't know. She, she did it. Now I have a memory of you showing me your nipples and they were like super infected like you had gotten like they looked really bumpy and they had really you could tell that visibly there was some something going on was that with Michaela I can't even remember now um I think so yeah and was that in those early days or was that later on yes yeah it was in the early days yeah and I remember thinking oh my god is that what it's like (laughs) Yeah, me too. I was thinking that too. <laughs> How do people do this? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I was just talking to somebody else about new motherhood and how when when I became a mom and I looked around at everybody else who became a mom and I said, this is what you've gone through? <laughs> this is what you've been doing? Yeah. You just yeah. you just don't know. You just don't know. You know. see them with their sweet little baby out walking around yeah. with their stroller and their yeah. baby carrier. Yeah. So you said after about two weeks it's yes. it clicked. Yes. And then what was it like? What what um, started to happen for you? It was became like just na- more more natural. Now after two weeks, I knew that in a couple of weeks, we would be getting our three older kids. Mm-hmm. So it was just trying to figure all that out with having a newborn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and it just became, um, I started pumping more and I started, I probably produced enough uh, for twins because I was literally pumping after every um after every feeding almost, which looking back now, somebody had asked me, 
I would probably tell him to tone it back a little bit because you're always it feels like you're always attached to something I guess right yeah um, yeah yeah and by the end I was like oh my gosh I'm so done with this because I had all these grand plans to like keep pumping after she was done breastfeeding and donating yeah right. I was like I, I just can't <laughs> right yeah yeah you feel so done by the end yeah 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 so um <clears throat> So at two weeks, it felt okay, and um, you're continuing to pump. And then by four weeks, you welcomed the older kids. Yes. My twins were almost eight, and um, my oldest was 10. Mm. For some reason, I thought they were younger. Yeah, 10 and eight. Mm. Okay. And so how did that impact um, breastfeeding? Were you able to breastfeed as frequently? Was night waking different? What I mean, um, did, did it change? It didn't change the frequency. I think it just, I had to switch in my mind, like become a new normal. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I look back and I don't, I don't regret my decision. I love all of my children, but sometimes you feel like, man, I just didn't get that experience of having that first baby for, you know, mm-hmm. however long until you have a second one. Um, but she was really a gift, you know, for even the, even the older kids, she was just, sorry, I'm going to cry. Mm. she was just you know the lord was just so gracious with timing even though it wouldn't have been my timing um they loved her and um she just it, it, she was a nice uh glue i guess um, to kind of bond you know yeah. all of my children together even though it was hard because she was so tiny mm-hmm. um but um I did have to learn, and I got very good very quickly because all of a sudden now you have multiple children. <laughs> I could walk around and breastfeed. I could, oh. I could uh, stand at the stove and cook dinner. <laughs> and yeah, breastfeed. yeah. Um, as long as as long as she was as little enough for me to hold her with one hand, uh-huh. um, I did breastfeed with one hand and walk around and get stuff done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> To a new mom, but I just had to uh, figure that out. Yeah, yeah. And she was born in May, so that means that it was like summer vacation. Yes, for the kids. Yeah. For the older kids. Yeah. So they were around all day, every day. Yeah. Um, for those first few months. And yeah. you, so then they were there all through your maternity leave, and then it was establishing a new normal again. Right at the right. end of maternity leave and starting up pe- the, the older kids going into new schools right? and then daycare. Yeah. For Michaela. Right. Right. Okay. Wow. Wow. That's a lot of transitions for yes. a yes. brand new mom and l- learning breastfeeding and milk supply and navigating all of that. Right. Did you ever rely on a carrier for breastfeeding? Um, I didn't, but like I've seen people do it and I'm and I in my head I think, man, how do they Like I think I've seen you do it. And oh, yeah. You get like I <laughs> <laughs> Like I'm still in my head I'm trying to work out how I would do that. <laughs> But um, I you didn't have two hands. <laughs> yeah, I preferred not to. Um, I I had a hooter. We you know the little cover up, the little hooter hider thing. Uh huh. I preferred not to be exposed when I was breastfeeding. Um, uh-huh. in public, anyways. Yeah. Um, and so um, I did have that, and I just carried it around basically. But mm-hmm. I did get very good at doing one handed things. But looking back, I'm like, man, if I could have figured out the carrier breastfeeding, that'd have been. I know. <laughs> you had two hands. And did you did you have a preferred hand? Like would you hold baby with one hand and you... Yes, I wanted to have my right hand free because I'm right handed. Okay. okay. So I, I cradled her with the left and uh-huh. um I exclusively wore uh breastfeeding bras, you know, either the sports mm-hmm. bra ones that clamp down or a regular mm-hmm. nursing bra. And, yeah. Um, I just, you know. Popped it out and went about my business. 
Yeah. And did you like to wear um, like layered clothing or nursing shirts? How did you manage that? Um, so, um, awesomely enough, I discovered some um, nursing shirts like on Amazon that are fairly inexpensive. You don't even know they are nursing shirts. Mm hmm. Um, and uh, I use those, but mostly I would just wear like a t shirt and then wear the mm -hmm. maternity bra. And no one also uh, told me about all the leaking that happens as well. So that was. Oh, uh, yeah. No one's talked about that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> humorous experience being in a store and thinking, oh my gosh, I need a baby right now. <laughs> Can I yeah. So you would be like out and about. Yes, like if I went to the grocery store, or um, you know, you just go out, run errands, or whatever, and then mm -hmm. you kind of suddenly feel like one of your breasts is about to explode. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm like, no, 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 no. You can just like, I don't know. Most people can have, feel it coming down. Yeah, and yeah. I would stand there like a dum dum, like holding, pressing. Sometimes if I pressed it real hard, it would stop. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So with, did you rely on anything to try to um, keep the milk from keeping your shirt, getting your shirt all wet? Yes, I used the little inserts, but now I think they have those things that will collect it and you can use it later. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing do. that you told me about that I had for Riley was the little suction thing. That thing is amazing. What was that called? The Haka. Yes. I still have it, actually. Yeah. Yeah, those are pretty good for... Um, I only found it to be good for the first maybe 12 weeks, but I'm... Oh, I, I loved it. Like, I could I tell if I was, like, getting it. full or whatever. It just... Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Although, I I don't know if I would use it, like, walking around the grocery store. No, but, I would not use yeah, it. But I wouldn't, mind, I wouldn't mind ducking into a bathroom if I was, like, super... Because then you could collect yes. it. Most right. of the time, I just let it leak, and I right. also learned during uh, Michaela what crying over spilled milk meant. Yes. When I very, very exhaustedly tried to pour some in a bag, and it dumped all over the floor, and I just wanted to lick it up. Because I was oh, just... no. <laughs> Standing yeah. there crying over I milk know. you just worked so hard to make. <laughs> I know. I've done that. Ugh. Or I've heard stories of people leaving it out just for way too long. Yes. You yeah. Know? And you, right, you just yeah. don't want to throw it away. I know. Yeah. Um, so how long, so you're making all these adjustments. You end up going back to work. Was that tra uh, transition? Okay. D it was. I mean, okay? Okay. I, um, emotionally it was hard because mm -hmm. you know you just don't want to go back to work with mm -hmm. your baby but um that first day i just told everyone at work don't talk to me about the baby yes yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna cry or leak <laughs> one of the other one of those two things no, wow. i will cry or leak and uh, at that time you worked in a hospital you worked at the same hospital you delivered at right no i worked oh. at a cancer center oh you were at the cancer center by then yes. right yeah. okay okay yeah so you were at the cancer center and did you have ample time to pump um, they did. Like, I would just duck into an exam room and say, I'll be back in uh, mm -hmm. 10 or 15 minutes. And um, they make these beautiful bras now that you can have hands free. So I would chart. I'd bring my okay. chart and stuff. And, yeah. and I do have a very hilarious story about pumping um, when I was in my state of total exhaustion. Um, I took this pump that dad bought um, and the bra... <laughs> The bra with the holes in it. You know what I'm talking about. Like zip up. Yes. Uh-huh. And I went to this very lovely place uh, near my house called The Nesting Place. It was a, it was actually a really cool little store, and it had lots of breastfeeding resources and people in there willing to help. And I walk in. I'm totally exhausted. I have a new baby. I don't know what I'm doing. And I say, my, my pump doesn't work. They said, What? I said, my, my pump isn't working. Like when I put it on, it won't stay on. And, and they're like, okay, let, let me, let me take a look. They <laughs> see the look on my face. I'm about to lose it. Oh, and they're messing with it and they're turning it off and on. And they're like, show me, show me how you use it. And I'm like showing them. And then finally I said, <laughs> I said, well, when I zip up the bra, uh, or no, no, I didn't have the bra at the time. Sorry. 
I said, when I put the pump on, it won't stay suctioned on. <laughs> it won't stay on. <laughs> and they're like, it doesn't suction on. You have to have this bra on. I thought, and it's still in my head, it still makes sense to this day. That when you would put it on and turn it, it on, just, like its natural suction would just stay, stay on, on. Your breast. <laughs> like the baby. Yes. So, so they, they were like, I'm sure they were trying so hard not to laugh because it was a good 15 minutes of them trying to figure out what was wrong with my pump. And um, I was so mortified after I figured out that that's not what the pump is supposed to do. <laughs> I wanted the floor to just open up and just swallow me right there. Um, and they very kindly ushered me over to these bras that you can buy to keep the pump on <laughs> so that you're hands free. Okay. And I bought one. Okay. But it is a funny story. And it highlights how little support we get trying to navigate this stuff. Like your dad literally went out and just bought a pump from Babies R Us and brought it to you and you were expected to know how to use the thing. And they haven't changed in like 20 years. Yes. Although I will say my assistant principal um, who just had a baby, she has this amazing little pump that she uses at work. Um, you can't even tell, unless it's real quiet in the room, mm -hmm. you can't tell she, it's on her. And she walks around yeah. and does her work. Yeah. It's very lovely. Yeah. 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 I, I work for a, um, a pump distributor. You, you probably know this. Oh, okay. Do you know I don't that? think I do. No. Yeah. I've worked for a pump distributor for the last four years. Maybe I should interview you. <laughs> Maybe we should cut this out of the podcast. <laughs> Let me introduce you to my sister, Lori, who I know nothing about. <laughs> yeah, it's called Vital Milk. We take we, we. Oh, I did know. I didn't know it was a pump dis distributor. Yeah, we okay. we supply insurance covered um, breast pumps, and people are constantly asking us for the wearable pumps, <clears throat> but they're not covered by insurance, so we don't supply them. But also, they only work for like. 30 to 50% of people who try them. And so we looked into supplying them and just telling people like, yeah, you can get a discount with your insurance because basically insurance is used like a coupon for them. But when we started investigating, we're like, oh, we would hate to supply these and have people use their insurance benefit on them. And then like it, it not really work well. And then, so we always tell people like, get your insurance covered pump and then if you want to pay out of pocket for one of those and see if it works for you that oh, that's great. a good idea because then you at least have a pump and can remove milk while you're at work and then try one of those out and see if it works for you but don't waste your insurance benefit on one if you don't know if it's going to work yeah that makes sense <laughs> Yeah, so. yeah, but they the idea of them, I actually just read this book called The Big Letdown. Yeah. And it's all about how, you, you know, all of the things that get in the way of people successfully breastfeeding in, yeah. in our culture, um, from like medicine to um, formula companies to, you know, you know, to everything, to yeah. like political policies that that make it hard for women right. to that make women have to go back to work so early right um after having a baby and um but one of the things it talked about is how like we can literally put a person on the moon and we haven't figured out better breast pumps because no one has prioritized it you know they're clunky yeah. you have yeah, to they hold are, them they are on. pretty they are pretty clunky you know, like, and so the fact that we finally do have these wearable pumps, of course, people love them and think they're amazing. But they're pretty expensive. They need to, I think, if they were more cost. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. will say um, through all of this, I, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of breastfeeding. I love the fact that I was a little sad when I was done. Um, even though you kind of get your body back, I guess people think of it kind of that way, but. Um, 
I do love to encourage people to do it, to try it, give it a good, mm -hmm. a good old try. Um, yeah. If you're adamantly against it, I mean, you know, that's your, that's your choice and I'm not going to sit in judgment of you, but whatever you decide, don't let other people's opinions, you know, make you feel a certain way as a mother, because we're all trying to figure this out together. Right. And, uh, you're, everyone is, does want to be the best parent they can be. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So how long did you end up, um, breastfeeding Michaela? Um, she was about 14 months. She kind of, I heard how painful it was to stop. So somebody had encouraged me to wean, you know, to like go down to three feedings a day. Mm -hmm. And then uh, two feedings a day. And so we got to where we were doing the morning and the night. Um, and then, uh, and then we were doing just at nighttime. And then one night she just was like, mm, nah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Ah. 14 months old and then I thought it was just an anomaly maybe she was tired and then she did it like the next three nights in a row and she was done wow uh, and then Jacob probably would have breastfed until he was in kindergarten if I'd let him yeah he was not happy yeah uh, but I weaned him to you know just like and I was blessed enough to not work during the first four years of his life okay uh, Full time. I was a float nurse for. I had a, a couple of years into. Uh, um, when Michaela was a couple of years old, I moved to the a school district, which was been, and I'm there now as a, as an RN, and I love it. I love the hours, and I get to have the summers with my kids and stuff. But, um, I I weaned him as well, and then one day he was about 18 months. Um, we stopped breastfeeding altogether, but we were doing for a long time, just in the morning when he woke up, cause it was kind of comforting. And then, um, at bedtime and my goal, I had a goal to make it a year, mm -hmm. um, with each of my kids, because at a year, you know, they can go to whole milk and, yeah, um, you know, some people do longer, some people don't yeah. make it quite as long, but I wanted to do a year to not have to use formula at all. And then I pumped with all of my kids pretty frequently and had a pretty good, supply in a deep freezer and you know one piece of advice someone gave me was to lay the breast milk flat on the shelf in the freezer and then you can stack quite a bit in a bin mm. um, so that's what I did and, and found that to be very successful so you laid it flat so that it would freeze better and then yeah it, fr it would it freezes it. flat in the bag yeah. mm -hmm. and then you can stack them against each other like in a big in a bin or something in the freezer so I had my yeah. own little like milk section in the freezer yeah, that's great. And did you end up using all of the milk that you pumped for all of them? I had a little bit left after Riley, mm -hmm. but I, yeah, I did use it for the most part. And it allowed me to stop pumping and not have to pump quite as much. But like, I didn't care what people thought. I, I have kind of learned along the way that it, you can like what the decisions I make or not like them. It's fine. Now, and I, of course, will take people's wisdom and adjust if I need to, but I drug that pump everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I pumped in the car, I pumped in the airplanes, I pumped, I've pumped everywhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I tried to be as discreet as I can, you know, but, uh, yeah. you know, I've put on the Hooter Hider and pumped, it pumped away when it, when I need to pump. Like, I just, I'm like, this is what I need to do. This is what I'm going to do. Right. Yeah. And so you used that same pump that dad bought you from mm -hmm. Babies R Us for mm -hmm. all of your kids? Yes. And it has been used yeah. recently by someone else. It's 13 years old and still works. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah. And, um, did well, you always use for Medela, but maybe they should owe me for some advertising. I know. Right. Um, did you use the same kit all the time or did you ever, I switched the out kit? the kits and that's the other thing no one taught me about mm -hmm. that. I wish is like somebody did actually invent, I think it may have been a lactation consultant had told me you do not want your nipple rubbing against the inside of the funnel because mm -hmm. it makes it even more raw, especially mm -hmm. when you're a new breastfeeding mother. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, good piece of advice. Um, yeah. So I guess she See, did kind of go over the pump. I remember her telling me that and me not even thinking about it. Right. So you, uh, 
ended up getting bigger sizes or you use the yeah or size. measuring and make sure because obviously your your nipples kind of get enlarged when you're pumping right and yeah. if you see you may not feel it when it's pumping and the nipple is kind of rubbing against the side of the funnel if it's doing that you need a little bit bigger funnel right yeah so did you have to buy a bigger size or you were able I to did, use i think i was able to use that one i think maybe i went and bought the next size up actually yeah um and then you know i was able to help other people along the way like it's fine. You know, and I used all the things like breast milk after, like right after you breastfeed and then letting your nipples air dry helps with mm -hmm. some of the bleeding and the, the pain that comes with new breastfeeding. And then I used a lot of the, I can't think of it now, but I used it. I can't think of the name of it now. It was a nipple cream that you put on. The, was, the lan, lanolin or something? Yes, it was lanolin. lanolin. Mm -hmm. That was, that worked quite a very helpful yeah and with jake i was dreading it because i knew how bad it, it hurt the first time but it was almost like uh like riding a bike i guess like your nipples already know and they've already done it so it wasn't nearly as bad the second and third time okay so we it was you... almost like they're calloused uh-huh or he sense? just had they just had better latches because it well, sounds I was like sore, but it, somebody had told me and you may, you may correct me on this because I don't know. Um, they um had told me that it's almost like your nipples up, like it's not as bad. Like when you get pregnant the second time, your body's like, oh, I've done this before, um, and that's why you get bigger faster. Um, it's I don't know if it's the same with breastfeeding, but it kind of felt that way. Yeah, I mean there is some. You you def you know what you're doing more, and so yeah. I think you can help the baby out more. That's but true. it definitely sounds like something was going on with Michaela anatomically that was making it hard for her to latch on, which yeah. was causing more damage to your nipples than there needed to be. Yeah, but who knows? Like we can't go back and right look right now. So second time around, birth experience was pretty similar with Jake. Um, actually, and no. I was dreading the labor because of what happened with Michaela, but my water broke actually at the school. Oh, yeah? Um, it was very funny because something was happening with a parent and a student that we'd been dealing with for several months, and I thought, I just peed in my pants. <laughs> and he was late, a couple days late, and so I... Um, went to the bathroom and I'm like, Hmm, this doesn't happen like the movies. It wasn't like a lot. So I was like, hmm, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and then it happened again, like a, several minutes later. And I'm like, what? So I changed my clothes and, uh, I called and I was like, I think I might be in labor. I'm not sure if my water just broke. And they're like, well, you need to come up here. Cause once the water breaks, you know, you're more susceptible to bacteria. Uh, and I was like, I hung up the phone and I told the office staff, I was like, um, I think my water just broke, but I'm going to go ahead and finish charting on this thing that I'm doing. And it was like something out of a sitcom. People running around <laughs> as if I'm going to drop a child right there in the clean. You're not, you're not leaving. Are you leaving right now? You are not staying here. It was funny. It was really funny. Like hair on fire, people running around. Um, <laughs> refusing to let me drive the one mile home. I'm not kidding. I'm like. I can make it home. It's fine. No, no. Somebody drove me home. <laughs> and then I drove myself the 30 miles to the hospital. <laughs> I, uh, it was really, really comical. And, and they were very sweet. They just were very panicked about me right. having a child right there in the school. Right. It, it reminds me of that office episode when Pam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was very much like that. It was very funny. And Dwight's like practicing with the watermelon. <laughs> the watermelon. Yeah. So, and then when I got to the hospital, um, it was literally like two pushing. It's like twenty minutes of pushing, and they're like, "Oh, he's the there was a resident or something in in my OB had not made it in yet," and they're like, "Start!" And they're like, "Nope, don't push, don't push, don't push." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> it, was like it was like a magical experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, were you medicated with Jake? Um, epidural? Yes. I was, I, I, 
I can't remember. I was going to say I can't remember, but yeah, I think I was. Okay, so you got there. Because the labor was like in. seven hours altogether. Okay. It was so much less than Riley. I mean, than okay. Caleb. Yeah. So you had at least enough time to settle in and everything. Yes. And, and then when the pushing started, that's what I had been dreading the whole time was the pushing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But it wasn't nearly as. No, it was like it was 20 minutes total of okay. pushing, maybe. Yeah. And so then, same thing, you were able to have the immediate skin to skin with him. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so you got to take uh, Jake then. And how do you remember how long it was until he was, till he latched? It was right away, like right there. Right the okay. Baylor encourages, I guess it says the teaching hospital. But they encourage immediate breastfeeding, like, okay. like right away. Okay. Yeah. And I, I was, uh, I did have to be stitched up with both of them, but Michaela's, the episiotomy was worse. It was okay. a pretty bad tear. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, um, and, and you noticed a big difference between Jake and. Oh God, it was night and day. Okay. Yeah. Were you worried going into it that it was going a little to be bit? Yeah, I just remember thinking, "Man, I'm not. I'm not sure I can do it this time around." If, mm -hmm. if yeah. So, were you thinking you might be a little more flexible? Um, I was pretty determined because after you know, after the couple of weeks of just you know a, a really bad experience of just trying to get it, I was pretty determined because. Um, once Michaela got it, it was pretty easy, you know, it was just, mm -hmm. and I remember thinking like how awesome it was to just be able to feed my baby, you know, just mm -hmm. to have that experience. And sometimes it wasn't, it was like, there's chaos going on. I'm like, Oh, I gotta go feed Riley or Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sorry. Guys, I needed. Y'all can deal with, deal with all this nonsense going on out here. You know, just that that bonding experience just to be it's right. kind of a cool thing to know that you're the only one that can satisfy this baby's hunger mm -hmm. yeah yeah for sure so okay and then, I, it was very good experience with Michaela once she got it but yeah yeah for sure and then um anything uh anything else of note about Jake's experience that sticks out in your mind <clears throat> Um, no, I, looking back now, I wish I would have let him breastfeed a little longer. Maybe even it was just at bedtime, but, mm -hmm. um, I just starting to wean him just because out of kind of necessity, I guess. But, um, you know, he was 18 months and I had made it, you know, six months past the year that I said that I would do it. Yeah. Uh, when he, when you're running up to me in public and pulling up my shirt, I'm like, oh, I think you're, when you, you know, it's time yeah. you, can, you can feed yourself. Right. Um, but yeah, that would, maybe the only thing I would change is maybe let him go a little bit longer at bedtime or something or, yeah. Yeah. But, um, once, once they I get had, older and older, that 18 months doesn't seem so big, but yeah. 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 It was a, it was a good experience with all of them actually. Yeah. And then, um, finally Riley, my, my little one's cousin, twin cousin. Yes. Twin cousin. Um, so the accidental home birth. Yes, the what, accidental home birth. Did that affect the breastfeeding at all? Um, no, she was actually very easy too, as traumatic as the birth experience was. Um, she, she latched pretty easily and got, now I didn't get the, uh, like immediate, like skin to skin. I mean, I got oh, the holder, did? obviously. I did, but it was just different because it was chaos with the ambulance and the police there and okay. um, all of that. And um, it was just, you know, a very chaotic scene as far as, you know, birthing a baby in a house. But that wasn't planned anyways. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. All of the experience that came with that. But um, I was more concerned about uh, her well-being because I wasn't sure what was going on. Um I didn't know the labor was so different that I didn't realize she was coming right now. Like I was in such severe pain, but it didn't feel the same as the other labor pains. Um, I th that later I found out that the OB told me that um, she had dropped into my birth canal so quickly was why I was having such horrible. I thought I had like broken my hips. It felt so terrible. 
-hmm. And I was actually Googling that, like, and that's when I had decided I have to go to the hospital right now. I can't take this pain anymore. But he's, you know, as the baby descends into the birth canal, your hips kind of just start expanding to allow Mm -hmm. the baby. Um, But she dropped in there, I guess, really fast is what he thought. And it just opened up my pelvis. Mm. And that's when I was in the excruciating pain. And then (laughs) it wasn't funny then. It's funny now. I was like, I have to poop so bad. I'm not. One of my biggest fears with all of my kid was pooping on myself in labor. Yeah. I know that shouldn't be your biggest fear, but it was a fun. It's a lot of people's. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I'm not worried about birthing. I'm not worried about pushing this kid out. I'm worried about pooping. Right. Um, And so I went to the bathroom and suddenly realized when I was standing over the toilet, that's not poop. It's a baby. That's a baby. Oh my gosh. Terrifying. And, yeah. And that's when I said, uh, we are not going to make it to the hospital. And we had moved and I had changed OBs because mine was, uh, was retiring and, da- and I was having to drive 30 miles and I was do- continuing to do that because I loved him so much. Mm. Um, but once he retired, I switched to another, uh, OB that was closer to my home and, uh, the hospital was only a few minutes away. But when I realized that that baby was coming, I said, we are not going to make it. You have to call 911. And the response I got was really, <laughs> because I tend to be more stoic and I tend to, uh, especially when it comes to medical stuff to be more, uh, reserved. You don't hate things. Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I don't make things a big deal until I know they're a big deal. So mm-hmm. when I got, uh, really, are you sure? It's only five minutes. I was like, she's coming right now. <laughs> it is what exited my mouth. Um, so yeah. So the 911 operator, which I, I still have the recording. Uh, you do? Yeah. Um, I'll send oh. it yeah. They sent it to me. Uh, the 911 operator and they honored her like three months later. And I, we also took her up to the, uh, the paramedics that responded to the call. Uh-huh. And the paramedic was telling me that most of the paramedics, uh, do not like to respond to, uh, women in labor calls because it, I guess it's just scarier. Yeah. But the other thing he said that I had never thought about, and he, he actually, there's one guy that likes to respond to them. And this other guy, he was a little bit younger said, I wanted it and I came over the thing and said, I want this one. Don't give it to whoever the other paramedic was. Uh Um, And he said, because typically when they're calling 911 about a woman having a baby, we respond to so much horrible things in people's lives that responding to a a baby being born is such a positive. I'm going to cry talking about it. Sorry. It's such a positive experience. Like I want to be a part of that. Instead yeah. of when people call 911 and it's always, it's typically tragic, like something bad has happened. Right. So and that was like, most of the time when a baby is born so precipitously at home, the baby is fine. Yes. Yes. And the mom. Yes. And uh, I was concerned because I didn't know what was happening. Um, of course you were in yes. that moment. Of course. Yeah. You were. And then yeah. once it was realized that you're just a dumb dumb and didn't realize uh you were dropping a baby right there then um it was fine but yeah my initial concern was something is wrong yeah Uh, yeah. oh man so i it it changed the birthing experience because i was trying so desperately and i am not a i'm more stoic even when i'm in a lot of pain i don't like to be touched i don't like Mm -hmm. to be talked to i don't like to be stroked and coddled i Mm -hmm. like to be left alone and uh, so even on the 911 call, I'm not yelling or screaming because I'm like, something is wrong and I need to get this baby out right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was very focused on getting her out because I, I did think at that time that something might be wrong. Yeah, right. Oh, man. Um, so once baby's delivered, were you able to tell right away that she was okay? Yes. And um, she was born... And about two minutes later, maybe less, the uh, paramedics were there. Okay. And so then they kind of took over assessing her and everything. And she, I didn't hear her cry right away, but that may have been my own, like, 
fogginess. I'd have you to listen like, to the tape again. In a funnel. Yeah. And that's when mm-hmm. I was like, why is she not crying? Why is she not crying? Like, I remember being a little panicked about that, mm-hmm. but she was totally fine. Yeah. And so how long, um, they didn't, did they cut the cord or anything or did they wait till you got to the hospital? No, they allowed Tom to do it. And so okay. it was cut there at the house. Okay. So the Thank cord goodness. Was and I did had with Michaela, I did register for the cord blood registry. Uh huh. Um, and so she does have her cord blood in a bank. I didn't do it with Jake and I guess I couldn't have done it with Riley because yeah. Right. They collect the way they collect it. It's very like specific. Right. Yeah. So then, um, did you try to feed her in the ambulance? What did you, I don't remember what I did now. I, I don't think I did. I think I was kind of in shock about what yeah. just happened. Um, and so I remember holding her and they put the weird, you know, that silver like astronaut looking blanket on mm-hmm. me and her and she was messy and I was messy and it was just, um, I remember thinking, I hope I didn't mess up the floor. Um, <laughs> of course you thought that. <laughs> I mean, we had like towels on carpet. <laughs> Yeah, well, what's funny is I tried to get on the bed because it's, like, more, it's elevated, you know? Uh-huh. And I heard the 911 person say, do not get on the bed. So I laid down on the floor. Uh-huh. I guess they worry about falling off or oh the baby falling or something because, you know, it's just, they're not there to monitor. So. Right. Um, I had, the reason I'm going to ask this question is because um, it's, it, it has to do a lot with like, you know, policies that make it really hard for people having babies and feeding their babies successfully breast milk. Yeah. And, and I had heard, I think when you originally told me the story, the reason, one of the reasons that you were in denial that you were in labor all day was because you were wanting to work that extra day in September because it had something to do with the leave that you would get. Well, I forgot to sign up for my short-term disability plan. <laughs> okay. And it didn't take effect until September 1st. I would have to show up to work and be and be working on September 1. Okay. Um, and, and she was born yeah, September 1. I, I still missed it because I didn't get to go to work. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on the 31st, and she was late. You know, so all my, none of my kids came on time. Mm -hmm. Uh, But um, I was also in denial because I didn't feel terrible. I just kind of felt off. And so I Mm -hmm. thought I probably am in labor, but um, I knew as the evening wore on, because everyone thinks that I had this baby in my house because I refused to believe I was in labor. But I had kind of known by the evening time after I got, because I labored most of the day at work. Um. On the 31st. Yes. I felt bad. I was having a little bit of symptoms, but I wasn't feeling awful, you know, like as you labor. So I labored most of the day at work and then I got home after work and I had, I went to bed and I had, you know, I arranged the other kids had practice and other things. But as the evening wore on, I was like, oh, I'm in labor. Like I knew it. Okay. Okay. And so I stayed up because there was no way I was going to be able to sleep. And my contractions were like, you know, 30, 40 minutes apart. And then they went to 20 okay. minutes apart. And I'm kind of watching the time. And then I started, it was like suddenly I started feeling hor- like so horrible I can't describe it. I was like okay. Googling, has anybody broken their hip- hips? My hips right. were so bad. And well, later, this was transition. Yeah. And I was like starting to throw up and I was like and that's when I was and then I thought I'm not I was in the living room kind of distracting myself with the tv and I was trying to figure out how I was going to make it from the living room to my bedroom which was a little bit of a distance because I was like something's not right I was I even googled when I googled the hip thing I was trying to do these silly exercises where you like you know I'm nine months pregnant over nine months pregnant you like bend over this chair and like move Uh your legs out out. Yeah, yeah, I was trying all kinds of things that I found, and I thought this is not working. I gotta go. I cannot take this pain anymore. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and then I had a little bit of a of the, like the bloody show in one of the other. I made it to one of the other bathrooms, and then uh-huh. that's when I made it into my own bathroom, and it was like, get up, get up, we, you know, like I gotta go right now. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So anything um, related to her feeding that you, that was different about the other two? She was relatively seamless. I think by the third one, you know, I just had, you know, you do all the things, making sure their mouth is open, wide open, Mm -hmm. uh, making sure if they're not attached right, take them off, redo it, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I had tried those nipple guards a couple of times, but they, you know, people will use them to breastfeed or whatever. They just, I could never get them to sit right. They probably make some better ones now, but. um. They're really you meant to be used as a stopgap, as a temporary measure. Yeah, and so yeah. Um, I just had decided, you know, we're gonna. I've done it with the other two. We're gonna, but she she did attach relatively easy, mm-hmm. and um, and I still had like, and that, at this time I'm working by myself in a school, um, and so I would just shut my clinic door and say, you know, the clinic unless there's a medical emergency. And a couple of times I did have to unattach myself and go deal with something, but. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, so you would bring her to work with you? Huh? You would bring her to work with you? Oh, I'm you? talking about the pump. Like, Oh, pumping. Yeah, like okay. at work, I was able to, to pump. Oh, her. right, yeah. right. Yeah, because you were a school nurse. Yeah, yeah. At campus at that yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah, so at what, um, 12 weeks, you... Yeah, the beautiful thing about her. when she was born was that um, after the 12 weeks, I was only there like three weeks, and then I got two more weeks for Christmas break. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, and so it's been really nice being in the school system because I do, I get the same breaks as the kids. And Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then how long did she breastfeed? She was about uh, 14, 16 months, something like that. And I think she mm-hmm. also kind of just weaned herself. She was kind of done. She was just like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm ready to move on. When you're number six in a family, yes. there are many other distractions. Yes. You have to raise yourself. <laughs> I, I do laugh at the amount of times people are like, are you going to, when she's doing something crazy, because she is a little bit wild, um, climbing mm-hmm. things and jumping off things. And she's my only child that has written on the walls more than once. And uh-huh. um, it's kind of comical to, to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I have so appreciated you sharing your stories with me. This well, thank has been you really for having me. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And um, thanks for being the first. You're welcome. I just, I just hope I can be an encouragement to other women that want to try it. And if people want to reach out to me, they can. I'm no expert, but I can be a cheerleader. I like to be a cheerleader for breastfeeding even if you want to try it and you can't reach out to me i have i feel your pain at least with my first one yeah (laughs) i would just encourage you to stick with it until you get it and and seek out help people are more willing to help um even other mothers if you just are willing to ask the questions yeah exactly where should people find you if they want to reach out um my email is ridiculous i realize and i'm professional it's and the cow says moo exactly like you say it at yahoo I do have mm-hmm. a Facebook page. I try and stay off social media. It's Amy Daniel Simpson. I think I have Instagram, but I have no idea what the awesome. thing is. I'll put, I'll, I'll put your contact info in the show notes so people can reach okay. out to you. And to I don't me. care if they, you can give them my phone number too. I don't care. Okay, cool. Yeah. And also just navigating, if anybody's navigating um, foster care system. Oh, or that's, like, this is true. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm know, a big insane. advocate and. I know that I've yeah. shared my whole life story about some hard things we've I've walked through, um, but I still think that caring for caring for the orphan is God. Oh, I'm crying again. Uh, um, is an important part of our society too, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, love you, Amy. Thank you All so right. much. Love you too. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Bye. I started the Milk Making Minutes because I'm passionate about supporting breastfeeding people. But more importantly, I knew that hearing real people tell real stories would benefit both the storytellers and the listeners. I had this idea for three years before I launched. I asked so many people how I should begin, and Anchor came up repeatedly as the easiest way to launch a podcast. And I have not been disappointed. If you are passionate about a topic and have wanted to start a podcast, you can use Anchor to record and distribute your podcast. 
It's easy to use. You can use the editing tools right from the platform. You can distribute your podcast episodes seamlessly to listening platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts right from Anchor. And the best part is, it's free. And the tech support has been great too. Go to anchor.fm or download the app right to your phone to get started on your great podcast idea. Thank you so much for listening to the Milk Making Minutes. I hope you found connection and feel supported wherever you are in your baby feeding journey. The views expressed in each interview are deeply personal and sacred, and I'm so grateful to each person who is generous enough to share their story. It is also true that those views are solely theirs and do not necessarily reflect my opinion or advice as a lactation supporter, and this podcast does not qualify as medical advice. If you are struggling to feed your baby, please seek out the support of a local IBCLC.